Welcome to everyone who is still dialing into the Zoom. Um, and uh, well, second. Chris, no, that's okay. Take your time, Chris. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, Chris mentioned I, uh, my name is Chris Morris, and I'm the uh, Senior Field Director of the National Trust for Historic Preservation's Los Angeles office. And I'm also leading our campaign uh, to for Where Women Made History. So there's a through line to all of these sites today. They all tell diverse stories, uh, sites in California that reflect its really complex and diverse history. They are places that are currently threatened and they are also sites associated with women historically and women as preservationists who are helping to preserve this cultural legacy for the current and future generations. Okay, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Thank you so much, Chris. Oh, now my notes went away. All right, here we go. So again, thank you all so much for joining us today for, as Chris mentioned, the third and final entry in this webinar series on endangered sites of diversity in California. This uh, series is intended to highlight important places and stories around the state that really showcase the complexity and diversity of our history and our American story, as well as the people and organizations who are working tirelessly to save these special places. And today's webinar is no exception. Today, we're going to hear about the West Berkeley Shell Mound, a highly significant place of Ohlone history and culture, which has the potential to become a monument for reconciliation, healing, and justice. Before we move on, Chris, I just want to say thank you to you and John and the California Preservation Foundation, as well as our speakers today, Karina Gould and Toby McLeod. Next slide, please. I mentioned that we have a couple of through lines that tie all of these webinars together. And one of those is, and probably the most important one, is the National Trust's 11 Most Endangered Places Program. This is a major program of the National Trust. It's a public affairs and advocacy program. We announce this every year, 11 sites across the country that are endangered in some way and that need attention, national attention brought to them to help get them to a better place, to help them work towards a, a solution. And so this is an annual list that spotlights historic resources that are at risk of destruction or damage. And two of the sites that were a part of this series were on our 2020 11 most list, including the Shell Mound. The first site in the series is actually one that was just recently uh, nominated for consideration in our 2021 list, which is the Lion Martin House in San Francisco. Uh, the 11 most uh, program, for those of you who don't know it that well, is not only important because of the places that it helps save, all of which are very significant, but also the opportunities it gives us to collaborate with partners on solutions. And so again, you're going to be hearing from some of those partners today because without them, uh, we wouldn't be able to, to work together to get them into a better position. It also allows the National Trust to collaborate in ways that help us take direct action in support of those places. So it's not just a, a, a media tool, it's also an advocacy tool and we often get directly involved. And in the uh, 33 year history of the program, uh, only only maybe a few of those places uh, have been lost, less than 5% of the sites listed of those 300 uh, places listed have actually been lost. So we've got a fairly good track record. And next slide, Chris. Over the last few years, we've really been looking to make the, the 11 most listing reflect uh, the diversity of our, our nation's history, that we really want this to be a way for us to tell the full American story and, and look at preservation more and more as a tool for helping to support equity and justice and reconciliation um, with underserved and underrepresented communities whose history has often been overlooked or deliberately obscured. So today's presentation is a perfect example of that. Next slide, please. And so while you just missed our deadline, which closed yesterday for our 2021 listing of 11 most places, um, the announcement will be on June 3rd of this year. For those of you who do have a place that is threatened and that you are interested in having it considered, please uh, send us that suggestion to that address that you see there, 11 most at savingplaces.org. Um, sometimes we can figure out a way to still provide assistance or perhaps even consider it for the listing if you've missed the deadline. Um, but so, so please just keep that in mind. You can reach out to me directly or you can reach out to our 11 most endangered uh, email address. And with that, I am going to introduce our speakers. I have the privilege and honor of introducing our two speakers today. Uh, Karina, if you would like to turn on your video, hello. 
Thank you so much for joining us today. So we have two speakers today, Karina Gould, who is a Chichenyo and Karkin Ohlone, born and raised in Oakland, California. And she's the spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lejean and the co-founder of the indigenous women-led Segorite Land Trust. Karina has worked tirelessly to protect 425 shell mounds that ring the San Francisco Bay and is currently focused on protecting the West Berkeley shell mound and village site the first and oldest Ohlone settlement in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's a designated Berkeley City landmark since 2000 and one of our National Trust 11 most endangered sites in 2020. We're also going to be hearing today from Toby. Toby McLeod is the founder of the Sacred Land Film Project in 1984. Hi, hey Toby, how are you doing? And you founded that project to make a high impact documentary films that are relevant to indigenous communities and modern audiences. And we're gonna get a little sampling of your work today. He circled the globe for five years, filming Standing on Sacred Ground series, and also spent 10 years producing and directing in light of rev reverence and other award-winning documentary films such as Four Corners, A National Sacrifice Area, Downwind, Downstream, and Poison in the Rockies for Nova. And then later in our call, we're going to be joined by Berkeley Council member, Sophie Hahn, who's also played a significant role in helping to save this Berkeley shell mound. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Karina. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Good day, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in this virtual space. I want to welcome you into our territory, the territory of Kuchin. I would like to thank um, everyone for bringing us together in this space and place. And uh, it is our protocol to welcome people into our territories in different ways. And as we have come into this time of COVID, um, we have found ourselves in this different way of welcoming people. And um, the beauty of it is that we are able to welcome people from all corners of the world. And today is um, very similar to that. We are, have people from all over the country joining us in our territory. It is my great honor and privilege to talk about one of our sacred sites um, in the Bay Area, my traditional homeland, the traditional one of the traditional territories of the Lashan people, and give you a little bit of background and history of who we are as a, a nation of people that are not recognized by the federal government, but still are in our home territories, protecting our sacred sites and uh, working on our cultural revitalization. Uh, so our people have been called Costanoans, and we changed our names to Ohlone, and now we call ourselves Lashan, which is the original name of our people from the territories that we're in. And um, we are often thought about only in the past, and that is because the way history is taught in our public school systems is that um, in our territories, at least, fourth graders are taught about our culture in fourth grade, and they learn about us in the past that we used to be here, and we ate certain foods, and we dressed certain ways, and then by the time they get into fifth grade, they start learning about the gold rush, and then we kind of just disappear from history, but we've never gone anywhere. We have an unbroken tie to our lands and our waterways and have always been here and continue to be here in our own home territories. When Spaniards first got here, they uh, mistakenly called us Costanoan, and they lumped a whole bunch of tribal people into that category, thinking that we all ate the same foods and kind of dressed alike and kind of, uh, you know, used the same kind of housing. Um, and so they called us people from the coast, Costanoan. And later on, uh, folks decided they wanted to take on their own, a different name, their own identity, and started to call themselves Ohlone, another blanket generic term, um, but it's something that many of us, especially in the northern part of the territory, have taken on. And most recently, as we began to, uh, you know, in the last 10 or 15 years, people began to talk about this idea of decolonization and 
um, taking back names. And so we took back the name that our ancestors have called ourselves. My great grandfather, Jose Guzman, was one of the very last speakers, fluent speakers of our Chochenyo language. And when he introduces us, he says that we are Lashan, and that is the name that my ancestors uh, have always used. When you look at this map, you can see that there's actually eight different uh, languages that are in this in these territories that are broken up with eight different creation stories. And within each of these language areas, there are multiple villages. Um, and so there was never one overarching tribe in the areas that spoke the language. And the way I like to explain that is, if you can imagine a county and within each of those counties are multiple cities and each of those cities have their own municipalities and their own particular zone and whatever, the different kinds of laws. The same was happening here. Each of our uh, different tribes within the same language, very spoke the same language, but they had responsibilities to a particular area. Um, and so I have um, grown up here. Our tribe is actually made up of the tribes that were brought into Mission San Jose. So we are, uh, we are Chochenyo and Karkin speaking uh, Ohlone. We are also Bay Miwok, Plains Miwok and Northern Valley Yoka. Our villages um, were along the bay for thousands and thousands of years. And we talk about today leaving a smaller footprint on the earth as, as human beings. And my ancestors actually lived like that for thousands of years. We made our houses and our boats, our basket materials were all biodegradable. Um, and the things that we did leave behind were shell mounds, our cemeteries, our places that we put our ancestors to rest for the final time. Um, our waterways, um, we were always along fresh water where fresh water met salt water. And those were our major village sites. And so, um, um, that was happening until the Spanish got here. And uh, for some of you, you may know that the Spanish got here um, uh, not that long ago, around the same time that uh, on the other side of America, they were fighting for their independence. Uh, the Spanish were just getting to California. And so America hadn't gotten here yet. So our colonization um, in this territory is much different than what happened back East. Um, and actually, there was a guy named Cabrillo that was coming down the coast of California um, about 200 years before that. And he saw the land and he actually called dibs on this land. Um, and it's really funny when I talk to kids about what, do you, what does it call, mean to call dibs? And they, they understand that you have a pink box and you have a donut in it and there's one left and you call dibs, it's your donut. And so actually that's what Cabrillo did coming along the coast of California um, saw the land and claimed it for Spain and the crown and made his way down to San Diego. Um, and about four days later, he actually passed away, but not before designating all of this land to Spain and not talking to the native people in our territory. And we didn't know anything about them. Um, and they actually stayed away for about 200 years. Um, uh, but then came back to the territory, back to this land in California, because they were afraid that the Russians were going to take over the land they had called dibs on. And um, because they were doing fur trade with Northern California native people, they were afraid they were going to come and encroach on this land that they had uh, stolen on paper. So they decided that they were going to use the mission systems a way for them to hold the native people and to hold the native land. And they had used this particular process in, um, in Mexico when they took land there. When the Spanish missionaries came, they came with soldiers and a whole different way and belief system than our ancestors could even imagine. Uh, they came here um, and devastated our languages and our cultures in different kinds of ways. And many of our people died as a result of the Spanish um, and the Spanish mission period being here in our lands. Our language was taken away. Our belief systems were outlawed. Um, there was diseases that were brought here that we were not able to deal with. Um, and people actually died of heartbreak and starvation. Um, and so, and, and dysentery. Um, there was foods that were, re were introduced to our ancestors that their bodies were not capable of digesting and the medicines that they would have been able to get from the plant life had been uh, grazed away by the animals that were introduced to our lands. Um, 
our ancestors, uh, once they became um, imprisoned at these missions, uh, could, were forced to stay there. They couldn't leave. They became the property of the church. And um, so what I call um, these missions were actually the first prison industrial complex of California. We are, my ancestors were forced to build their own prison system. And then they were forced to stay there, uh, changing the whole landscape of our territory in a very short amount of time. Um, the mission systems lasted about 99 years. And then in about 1921, Mexico uh, won its independence um, from Spain and they stole the land and continued the enslavement of indigenous people. And so uh, there was no conversations with the indigenous people on whose land they took over after they won their, um, their independence from Spain. They actually um, took lands and gave them to, um, to Spanish soldiers that had been here for a long time. And so that my ancestors became slaves on the ranchos that were created during the Mexican rancho period here. And in 1948, the United States won um, the uh, Mexico's, uh, won the, um, the land from Mexico in the Mexican American war. And so the land was stolen for a third time. And by that time, the um, United States was not interested in creating treaties with uh, native people anymore. As they came over here, we heard about this wave of people coming for gold, looking for gold. Um, and so really the first laws that were created were extermination laws of California Indians. Uh, they were not interested in trying to figure out how to live with us in our territories, but really about how to get rid of us. Um, these are, this is a land grant. So actually Peralta had, um, he was a soldier in the army for about 45 years and received this huge land grant. So there was lots of soldiers in the Bay Area that received huge pieces of land. Um, this is El Ranchos de San Antonio and it goes from about San Leandro to about Albany in um, the Bay Area. Um, and right here, is uh, about Oakland. This is where Lake Merritt is. If you uh, know where the um, the uh, the Bay Area's maps are, just to give you a little context. So as I was saying, the federal government was about um, really taking uh, taking away people's lives. The United States federal government paid more than a million dollars to reimburse California for the militia killing campaign. Or what I would say, you know, we talk about that there was actually about four point one point four million dollars that were paid to these militias to outright kill Native people and created the uh, disintegration of California Native families and tribal lifeways. Uh, because there were people that were coming here looking for gold. Not everyone could find gold when they got to the territory, but they could make a living by doing this harsh work of killing off Native people, um, being pa paid $5 a head and 25 cents an ear. And um, not only did the adults get killed, but then the soldiers or the militia would take the children into towns and would sell them um, to ranchers and to people, miners um, and folks into the, in the cities that were being created. And so uh, little girls would be sold for $300, uh, little boys up to 180 to $200. Um, and so the disintegration, the breaking apart of tribal histories and tribal connections um, started in this way by the creation of the state of California. It's a history that's not ta taught in our uh, in our schools, and it's a history that's really hard for even adults to swallow, learning this history for the very first time. Um, and so many of our ancestors had to do other way, uh, had to survive in other ways. My direct ancestors, um, the way that they survived this, this third wave of genocide is by pretending to be Mexicans as they had been working on these Mexican ranchos. They uh, pretended to be Mexican in order to survive this wave of genocide that happened here in California during those early times. So all of that was really heavy history um, to breathe through and to learn about. Um, and it really has only been in my lifetime that we have been able to really stand up and start talking about who we are and that we are still here. 
and the connections of our lands and to remind people in our territories that we haven't gone anywhere. And to really work with allies and accomplices to do this incredible hard work of talking about our sacred places in the Bay Area. <clears throat> we started doing this work over uh, two decades ago, um, working on protecting and preserving the shell mounds of our ancestors. This is a map that was uh, of our shell mounds and sacred our, our cemeteries that was recorded in 1909 by a man named Nels Nelson. And if you can imagine in the Bay Area that there was development happening at such a high rate that the shell mounds were in danger of being destroyed over a hundred years ago. Today, we see cranes in the sky all over the place as development is going up all over the Bay Area again. And, um, and they are continuing to find our shell mounds and are destroying them um, today as we speak. Um, but at that time, Nels Nelson found 425 of these shell mounds that ring the entire Bay Area. These funerary um, monuments that my ancestors created to bury our, our ancestors covered in soil and shell and rock until over thousands of years, some of them became over three stories high. The oldest, this is the, old, the largest one, was the Emeryville Shell Mound. Um, and as you can see at the top picture, um, this is the, the shell mound as they're beginning to take it away um, with steam shovels. And today it is a mall uh, that sits on top of it. And it sits on the corner of Ohlone Way and Shell Mound Street. And so the city of Emeryville knew that. It sits along the Temescal Creek where it goes into the bay. And 20 years ago, uh, 20 plus years ago, we started fighting that particular development. Um, <clears throat> the city of Emeryville had um, received some federal money to clean up a brownfield and decided to put a mall on top of it. And so um, instead of doing, uh, stopping the, the destruction of the shell, the rest of the shell mound that was there, they found hundreds of bodies and they put up this small mound that is supposed to represent uh, thousands of years of our ancestors being here. The current shell mound that we're working on is the West Berkeley shell mound, the oldest and first shell mound along the bay, the place where my ancestors um, have been since the beginning of time. We've lived in this territory for thousands of years, but we decided to, um, to create these shell mounds starting here uh, along the uh, bay shores where Strawberry Creek meets the waters of this bay creating marshland so that we can collect tulies and we can fish there. It was a fishing village and it was uh, quite a big thing. On the bottom, you can see the, um, what's left of the mound that was still intact um, after the encroachment of the city had already started. Now, almost five years ago, we got a phone call. So the city of Berkeley Landmarks Commission um, they landmarked this particular site over 20 years ago. They knew that this place was uh, a place of importance, a place that uh, should be venerated, a place that should be protected. And so the Landmarks Commission in the city of Berkeley knew that and they saved it in this particular way. They landmarked it 20 years ago. Well, what it looks like today, it looks like a parking lot um, and it looks like prime place for development. And what we know as indigenous people all throughout the states is that when a land is left by itself kind of and not, and not built upon, um, and this land has almost virtually never been built upon, 2.2 acres of land, um, that this is a really special place. And we have always known that this special place existed and continue to offer our prayers there. Um, but the developer came in and wanted to create high-end condominiums and big box shopping. And we showed up to a zoning board meeting that um, we were told about. And we started to uh, speak out against it. And we went to zoning board meetings for uh, and stayed hours with our allies and accomplices, um, keeping them up for uh, you know, till 2 a.m. on multiple nights, sent in uh, over a thousand letters against this development, um, went to landmark commission meetings and uh, talked to them and kept them up about their responsibility to help us to preserve this landmark that they created as well. 
And then we also worked with trying to create a different vision. Um, everybody in the public was seeing this top picture of this development, what it would look like. And we said, well, let us dream. So we worked with Chris Walker, who is a landscape architect, and I met at a zoning board meeting. And he asked to, to work with us um, and to create a different vision. And what I do know is that adults really actually need a vision to see. You know, you can talk to kids and they can imagine it in their minds, but adults really need to have a picture. And so we began to put this on on paper, on screen, really, and to imagine this 2.2 acres of land and what it could be instead, to reopen Strawberry Creek that it, that it would flow where it would, had originally flowed, to build up the land, not to build and dig into it ever, to create this mound-like structure um, that is covered with poppies and four months out of the year, it's bright orange, to be able to top, walk to the top and see the view that my ancestors may have saw um, to open it up so that there's a, an arbor there where we can bring back our dances, to build up the land, to grow our traditional trees there, to use the center inside of this, um, this mound as a 360 degree theater where you can sit in the middle and you can see, hear, smell, and feel what it was like 200 years ago in the bay on a shell mound. We talk about the word of rematriation and what does that mean? It's a word that we use and it's really what this, this work is. This work of uh, protecting and preserving sacred sites is really the work of rematriation. And it means to restore a living culture to its rightful place on mother earth or to restore a people to a spiritual way of life and sacred relationship with their ancestral lands without external interference. As a concept, rematriation acknowledges that our ancestors lived in spiritual relationship with our lands for thousands of years, and that we have the sacred duty to maintain that relationship for the benefit of future generations. Uh, Steve Newcomb um, actually created this um, uh, definition um, in the 1990s. And it really talks to my heart about the work that we're trying to do is that now that I'm a grandmother, that these particular sites, um, my, ch my, grand my children and my grandchildren need to have these places um, where they can do our original teachings. They can participate in, uh, in the, um, our obligations to pray at these places, to bring back those songs and dances. But it also gives us an opportunity to work with the people that now live in our land all the fourth graders that have to hear about our people. Um, there's not one place that they can go in our whole entire territory to talk about Ohlone people, not just in the past, but the resiliency of us continuing to be here on our own lands again, to bring back those songs, that language, those dances, not just for us, but for everyone that lives in our territory. These are some pictures of us at Landmarks Commission's meetings with people from all walks of life that are, um, that are there with us, young people, older people, um, Shell Mound preservationists like Perry and Stephanie who have been doing this work for over 20 years. Um, prior to even us working together, they were working on Shell Mound issues. Um, we have had thousands of people that have come and stood with us at the West Berkeley Shell Mound have uh, participated in prayers and ceremonies. We have stood up with uh, folks from Mauna Kea with, um, and it is doing their own protection of their own sacred site on, um, on Mauna Kea to stop a telescope from being built on their sacred place. We stand with them. Um, we gathered with people at the West Berkeley Shell Mound on the 4th of July as an alternative way of, of expressing what it means to be in this country and to stand up for places like the West Berkeley Shell Mound that uh, is important for all of us that now live in our lands. Um, we have had a beautiful mural artists that have come and have um, helped us create beautiful artwork on the lands as we celebrate this beautiful place together and um, celebrate the, um, the other things that happen on our lands, uh, like the um, MLK gathering that we had there a few years ago, where hundreds of people came and um, danced and prayed with us from all walks of life um, and, and intersects with everyone that lives in our territory now. 
we have had people from um, from all over the world come and pray with us. This is uh, uh, Chief uh, Ninawa from the Amazon who came and offered prayers here at the West Berkeley Shell Mound as well. And indigenous leaders from all over the country, uh, Chief Kaling Sisk and Kua Case from, um, from the uh, Mauna Kea and uh, Janella LaRose, who is the co-founder of the Segorite Land Trust and Indian People Organizing for Change, along with me. In 1919, uh, uh, 2019, we actually had to go into a court case. Um, and there was a new law that was brought in uh, called SB 35, which allowed developers to create uh, developments as long as half of the development was for low income housing. And so it changed the entire development. They changed the entire plan and they tried to go, uh, the developer tried to use this as a way of um, developing the land. And um, we actually, the tribe had to intervene with the city of Berkeley on the, on the same side of the city of Berkeley to ask the judge not to allow this to happen using that this was a historic structure that um, our ancestors um, uh, ceremonial place and burial place is still under some of this land here. And so this was part of the judge's ruling in November of, of 2019. A historical structure does not cease to be a historical structure or capable of demolition because it is ruined or buried. That proviso is without bias. It is in the text of the statue and would exclude many of the world's most beloved archeological treasures, such as the Hezeka and tunnel in Jerusalem, the Roman ruins in Pompeii, the mausoleum in King Shan Hong and the cave of Cappadocia. Um, and the tombs of the Valley of the Kings, any reading of the statute protecting historic structures would exclude such features from protection must be rejected. And so we won that court case. And we had a wonderful uh, gathering of people celebrating that. And of course, the following month, uh, the developers decided to appeal this. Uh, we are so happy to be a part of America's 11 most endangered historic places. And I shouldn't be happy to be on that listing, but we are. That listing allows us to uplift the work that has been happening with hundreds of people um, pulling together to save the West Berkeley Shell Mound and Village site. People like Toby McLeod and uh, and Sophie Hahn, who's on the council at, um, for the city of Berkeley, who actually worked on putting the application together so that we could be on this. It gives us an opportunity to voice our, um, our story uh, around the country to get more people and allies to help us to put the history right, to help us to save the West Berkeley Shell Mound and village site and to protect the, the places that are important to our, the in, indigenous people on whose land people are on. The future generations here, these are three of my grandchildren that are, um, that are living in our territory. We've not gone anywhere and they need to be, um, have a place, the, uh, the connection with our ancestors at this particular site is important for them to grow up with that language and that, uh, that belonging and to know that they have uh, still have a place in our home territory, a sacred place that um, that they deserve to, to be a part of. And so we ask everybody from all walks of life to come and join us in protecting and preserving the sacred site of the West Berkeley Shell Mound. And I think I'm turning it over to Toby. Thank you, Karina. I hope uh, my internet connection holds up here. Uh, what an honor it has been to work with Karina these last five years. Um, she has such a genius for uniting people from all, as she says, from all walks of life to join at this sacred site and work together. It's a real opportunity. She's welcoming Native Americans from all over the country um, I've been at ceremonies with Tibetans and Koreans and Hawaiians and Aztec dancers, and um, it's just been a, a real honor. And um, my job is to help tell the story, to work with a great committee of supporters who've been working with Karina as allies. And in a minute, we'll show a two-minute animated sequence 
uh, that Karina narrates done by Chris Walker, beautiful animation. And um, the, the one comment I, I wanna make really is that the West Berkeley Shell Mound, Malcolm Margolin has described it as a, a place of, that holds the story in the land and it's about our soul. And the effect that I see that sacred place, even though it's a parking lot with train tracks going by, um, has a uh, thing that I think ancestors are calling for, the social justice movement in this country is calling for right now. It represents an amazing opportunity for people to come together to really tell the true history of California and America and to really work together to protect a sacred place. In Berkeley, it's been incredible. You know, we have a lot of intellectuals, a lot of activists in Berkeley, and to see people just sort of shake their head and say, wait a minute, you mean there's been a village 5,000 years here in Berkeley, Ohlone people lived there and built this massive shell mound, and I didn't really know anything about that. And so it's been amazing to sort of help tell that story with Karina uh, of the, you know, the cosmic significance of the site where Strawberry Creek flows into the bay, where the Ohlone buried their dead, looking out at Alcatraz and the, and the Western Gate there. Um, I believe Berkeley, as everyone knows, has a kind of an energy about it. And I believe that Strawberry Creek flowing into the bay there uh, across from Alcatraz and the Western Gate, there, there's, a, there's a power to this place that Karina's ancestors sensed and it's still true in Berkeley. And um, so it's a real opportunity for people to come together and work to protect a sacred place under the leadership of an amazing woman and her community. So it's really great to work with Karina and um, we've been lucky to have the support of the city of Berkeley. I'll introduce Councilwoman uh, Sophie Hahn in a minute, but uh, why don't we watch the two minute video of the animation created by Chris Walker, which uh, so beautifully tells the story and enables all of you 180 people out there who are watching to get a sense of, of what the land was like before, uh, what it looks like now, and what Karina's vision is for it. Because we have to fight to stop the development and protect this place and then, and then build a park uh, that honors the Ohlone culture and, and the, his, the true history of California. So hopefully this will play and um, thank you all for being here. The city of Berkeley started on the shores of what we now call the San Francisco Bay. Before the university, before California cuisine, before landfills and parking lots, my people settled here in Huchin. More than 5,000 years ago, my Ohlone ancestors built the first fishing village on the bay. At the heart of it was a freshwater creek and two massive shell mounds. Archaeologists officially recorded a boundary for the site in 2003 making it eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. After the gold rush, the Spanger family built a restaurant and Strawberry Creek flowed right through their grotto. The shell mounds were scraped away to fertilize farm fields and pave city streets. In 1907, the site was studied and mapped by archeologist Nels Nelson. It was landmarked by the city of Berkeley in 2000. Today, the heart of our ancient village is threatened by a five-story retail and condo project. But we have a different vision for the best use of this land, a green space and a cultural park. In this one area left unbuilt, a 2.2 acre parking lot known as 1900 Fourth Street, my people still go to remember our ancestors with prayer and ceremony. This is where people lived and died, laughed and cried, and buried our ancestors in the shell mounds. Aluni people are still here, and we have a vision for this sacred site, not for the commercial development being proposed, but a green space with flowing water, a memorial park where we can rebury our ancestors who were taken away to museums, a place for reflection and ceremony for all. On the top, my people could see fires built on shell mounds across the bay. This is where we sang the old one spirits out through the western gate. 
This is the birthplace of Berkeley. Well, this is a great use of this video, and I want to highlight Chris Walker, the animated genius who's completely obsessed with helping us protect the West Berkeley Shell Mound. I think Chris is with us, so thank you, Chris. And also, I want to do a shout out to Chris Dorr, the archaeologist who has helped uh, make this site eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. I saw Chris's name on the attendee list. And um, I just want to follow that by, by saying that um, as a, you know, an a immigrant to California, it's just been such a uh, honor to work with Karina and to uh, feel the power of the place uh, that, that is offering a real healing opportunity for people to collaborate and join together to work against the sort of imperative of private property and capitalism and honor the real Ohlone ancestral heritage of Berkeley. And, so I want to thank uh, council member Sophie Hahn, who's with us, who has been incredibly helpful uh, as a member of the zoning board and now as council member. Um, the city of Berkeley has just been a great ally in the work that we've done to protect the site. So welcome, Sophie, and please take it away. And, and then after Sophie's finished, well, I guess we'll go to questions and answers. So hi, Sophie. Thanks for being here. Well, hello, and thank you for uh, inviting me to join this um, presentation today. And thank you to all who came to learn about this amazing um, site uh, right in the center of, a, of an urban area. I think people don't always realize that we have um, the, the indigenous cultures and history in the middle of our metropolises, because this is not just in Berkeley, it's all the way around the Bay that, um, that this, this history and these vibrant cultures that are still with us today are essentially erased. Um, I wanna thank Karina Gould, who is such an inspiration. Um, this is the third or fourth time I've heard this presentation. And I have to say that it truly brings me to tears every time I hear it. A uh, deep sense of shame for uh, what we have done in this country. And also, it always renews my commitment um, to work to make sure that we can save this shell mound site. And it's not just a shell mound site, it's a village site. Imagine how many people you needed to create shell mounds of that size over centuries. People lived, they had children, they were born, they, they, they passed away, they celebrated this site is not just a shell mound. It is the site of the heart of a vibrant community and culture. And it's, it's critically important that we um, defend it. The city of Berkeley, as you know, has a long um, connection with civil rights and human rights. But I will say that I think our um, consciousness and our advocacy on behalf of indig indigenous people and has been patchy. Um, we, we were the first city to declare um, an Indigenous Peoples Day instead of Columbus Day. Um, we did do the landmarking of the village and uh, Shell Mound site in uh, 2020. And more recently, we posted signs uh, at the entrance of the city all the way around that say Ohlone Territory. So when you enter Berkeley now, it says, welcome to Berkeley. Ohlone territory. And it's a small symbolic act, but it's powerful. And I'm glad we did it. But I think our biggest battle is this battle to save the village and Shell Mound site, which is threatened by development. And it's a difficult environment because we do need housing. And there is a very strong push at the state level and in the Bay Area and in Berkeley to increase housing. And I think we all support that. But we can't, we have to have more than one thing that's sacred. Housing has become almost sacred uh, because it is scarce in the Bay Area. But um, the city of Berkeley also recognizes that we have to defend other things that are sacred. And this is a recognized historic site 
and we know it's a sacred space. And um, I am just delighted that having been elected to the council and working with a mayor who is also committed to this, that we have been able to use the city's resources to defend our designation of this as a city, as, as a historic resource. So um, it's a long battle and um, there are many people engaged in it, but clearly uh, Karina Gould is the leader of this. And it's just a, an honor to know her and work with her and with uh, the, the entire team. And I just hope that all of you who are learning and listening today will join in this effort because it is not easy and there is a lot of work still to be done. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sophie. Um, we really appreciate this. This has been such a powerful program. I'm actually a little bit speechless about everything that you've shared uh, about this site. And I wanted to thank all of you, uh, Toby and Karina and Sophie and Chris Morris for bringing this to our attention. And the chat box, we're getting a lot of comments, as you mentioned, Karina, that people had no, I had no idea of any of this history. I was raised in Los Angeles in the 70s. And of course we didn't learn any of these things. Um, we're going to have some, what we'd like is if you have a question, uh, it's best if you can put that in the Q&A box so that John and I can kind of keep track of what's going. But I wanted to just start with one question that came up in the chat. And maybe this is for Chris Morris so you can introduce the discussion. But in this three-part series that we've been talking about, uh, this concept of home has come up uh, repeatedly uh, in the Harada house, in, in this, um, in the heritage of the Ohlone, um, what would you uh, say, is there, is, what would you call that concept of home and understanding of sites of diversity in, from your position, Chris? Uh, thank you, Chris. I, I don't know that I've got the answer to this. I saw that Mark, um, who was Mark Rawich, who was the author of The House on Lemon Street in, our, in part of our last presentation on Harada House raised that question. And it's such a, it's such a good point. And I think what it really reflects in the few minutes that I've had a chance to think about this is really the way that we are changing the way that we approach history and culture, that so much of this is now about not, not just sort of understanding and recognizing history, but respecting it, really thinking about what our relationships are to these places, not only what they mean to, to the rest of the, the culture, but what they mean to the people whose culture it represents. And so that we're really looking at ways through our work to help support people in doing the work to preserve the places that matter most to them. And, and you can define home in so many ways. And, and Karina did just such a beautiful job of talking about how a single site can represent layers, hundreds, thousands of years of, of culture that so many people have kind of imbued those, those layers of meaning onto it. And so I feel like we saw that in very different ways with the Harada House, sort of a, a, a century of history that was reflected there. And then with the Lion Martin House, sort of a half a century of, of achievement uh, of, of Phyllis and Dell. So that I would, I would love to hear from Karina about this. Thank you so much. Um, yep, taking a, a deep breath <laughs> after this and yeah, I. You know, I, we have conversations all the time with people about what is home. And um, especially when we start talking about sacred sites and the connection that sacred and that the sacred sites bring up with people. And so over the, you know, over two decades of working with people, we talk about the concept of home. And what does home mean to you? And where are you? And where is your original home? And how do we begin to look at where our original homes are? I work with a, a, a group of people, one of our groups of allies and accomplices in the Bay Area, and they've created their own group called Irish on Ohlone Land. And uh, they have actually taken it upon themselves, uh, many of them to go home to Ireland. And when they come back from Ireland, they tell me, you know, I understand better what it means to go home, what it means to be connected to a home. When I go there, I could hear them speaking our language. I go to the cemeteries and see our family name. I know where the village is that we come from. And 
it changes my concept of home and it gives me an integrity of fighting for your sacred places. And so I know not everybody has the opportunity to go home and many people can't even go home anymore, wherever that is. But I think that when we begin to think about our own um, internal pulling of where is home, that, um, that we become better allies and accomplices, that we begin to work better with each other to preserve these sacred places. Um, you know, and home is, uh, is different to a lot of people. We share our homelands with thousands of people and now we share our story again. And so I'm just honored to, to be able to do this work on behalf of our ancestors. You know, I tell, the, I tell folks that we are just the bridge between the, those that came before us and those that are coming after us. And the work that we do on this land right now is important for those yet to come. And so I'm hoping that as people look at this land as creating it as part of their homeland, they realize the importance of standing up for sacred sites in places like this on whoever's territory you're living on now. When I hear Karina talk about um, the, the European connection, it reminds me when I was in, and I went to Yale and I didn't like it very much. So I went, spent my junior year abroad in Scotland. And I went to the Isle of Skye where everybody's named McLeod. And um, I have learned so much from Karina about listening to the, to the ancestors, you know, kind of feeling the presence of our ancestors physically within us and also on a spiritual level. And I felt that in Scotland. And I think it's one reason when I approached Native people 40 years ago and said, I'm, I'm an outsider, but I'm interested in, you know, sort of helping to tell your story. The fact that I'd gone back to Scotland instinctively um, to kind of connect with my own original home, uh, I think it made a difference. And um, again, I, I just can't thank you, Karina, enough for your open heartedness and um, the way you welcome so many people in, who are, we're all invaders in your territory. We're all immigrants. You know, I've, I've heard you say that when you wake up in Oakland, not only are you home, but you're in the place that your ancestors have called home for 5,000 years. And it's just unimaginable. The fact that your ancestors are buried all around you just gives you a connection to this area that is so unique and so powerful. So um, it's a great question about how we feel about home and, and the meaning of home to each of us. So thanks for that, Chris. Chris and John, I just wanted to ask of, of both the council member and Toby and Karina, given that so many of us are learning so much about this history and are shocked to find out about the threat to it, and that is another another unfortunate link between all of these places is that they are all threatened in some way, shape, or form. What can the people on this webinar do to help support the efforts, either to help you fight the current lawsuit that's going on or to help support the efforts to create, to turn this space into a, a monument and a, and a space of reconciliation? Karina, you want to take that one? <laughs> I thought you were, Toby. <laughs> fill in after you. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that question. You know, um, I know it's in the chat some. Just go to uh, shellmound.org, which has a beautiful website that was created by our allies um, to that tells a beautiful story and has maps and different ways that, and tells uh, you know, the history of, of this particular fight. We are currently in, um, in appeals. We currently do have legal uh, obligations to our lawyers. And so we um, have a, a donate button on that particular um, site. You know, we are looking, you know, COVID has, has held us up from being able to gather on that site together and um you know and we had been gathering there every few months with hundreds of people and we're looking forward to that time again um we are looking you know of course for uh, we're looking at different ways of looking uh, of dealing with this once we're the appeals is complete uh, we're thinking in late spring early summer you know that we will be able to do uh, do something else um, at the site, we're hoping that COVID um, is stopping, 
uh, but right now we're we're really just looking for some financial support for for the legal fund right now for and for, and for us to do that we're hoping that we're going to create a different kind of campaign and the um the committee is looking at what those campaigns can look like in terms of whether or not we're able to get this land there's not a willing seller and that's uh, uh, one of the problems is that we need to have a willing seller in order to create this dream um, to protect this site um, forever and um, and so that's been what the uphill battle ha has been um, is really trying to figure that out. Maybe Toby, you can add something else to that. It looks like Toby may be frozen. I'm gonna just jump in and um, give a big push here. Uh, the city of Berkeley is, is litigating, but of course we litigate on, on our behalf. We are defending our own historic site that we have designated. Um, and it's, you know, down in the weeds of, of legal, of legalese. But um, the uh, Karina's group is participating in that litigation. They are, they have their own attorneys and they have to pay for them. And their, their work is complementary to the work of the city of Berkeley. In addition, uh, you know, this could be just one lawsuit. The lawsuit doesn't, doesn't ensure that the site will be saved. And it does not ensure that if it can be saved, that this amazing uh, uh, revitalized site, park, uh, home, place of return is actually created. So look, I, I'm an elected official. I'm not afraid to ask for money. Um, what we're talking about here is that Karina Gold's organization and her efforts require financial support to be successful. The city of Berkeley is not going to be able to do all of this alone. And, and in fact, it is really her efforts and um, th that is the engine on the broader part project here. So um, this, this effort needs money and it needs support. It needs people to sign up and say they're gonna be part of the movement. Um, and maybe it's gonna need people to show up at some point. We don't know what it's gonna need. Uh, you know, get your get your camping gear out because maybe we're all going to have to be there on that site sometime, defending it in that way. So this, I am a partner. The city is a partner, but the city is not going to be able to do all this alone. Uh, and and Karina Gold and the Shell Mound uh, and Village project here need your support. Thanks, Sophie. Um if people go to the shellmound.org, you can um, give us your email address and sign up for future information. And another thing that uh, Karina has created through the Segurite Land Trust is the Shumi Land Tax, which allows residents of the Bay Area to voluntarily offer to pay a sort of a tax, a tribute, a kind of a property tax to the original owners, $50 a year, $1,000 a year, you can go to the Segurite Land Trust website and sign up for the Shuumi tax, which is another brilliant way of, of supporting Karina's work on a, on a larger scale. So stay tuned. This is going to be a multi-year battle to protect the West Berkeley Shell Mound and village site and build that park and a museum that tells the truth about California history and Ohlone history. Thank you, Allison. Just donated. <laughs> uh, there were a lot of questions um, that uh, we may not be able to address today, but I think one that uh, came up was about your efforts with the land trust and maybe Karina, Karina, could you tell us more about those efforts and how it goes beyond, maybe may go beyond the shell mound and to a larger purpose. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, so we're a landless uh, tribe in our own territory. We have no land and one of the works that we have been doing for over two decades was really praying about our ancestors' return. Um, of these many uh, shell mounds in the Bay Area, uh, multiple institutions hold our ancestors in their possession and they need to be returned to the land as part of the healing process. And um, one of the things that we realized is that if one of these institutions decided to give us our ancestors back, we had no place to put them. 
And so we decided that we needed to do a land trust in order for us to bring land back into indigenous hands, to bring back culture, song, dance, and ceremony, to bring back relationships, not only between with Ohlone people in our territory, but to bring people that are now living in urban areas back into relationship with the lands on which they live. Uh, a way for us to remember our responsibility and reciprocity with the lands. Uh, a way for us to talk about how in 200 years, the Bay Area is a baby. And that in 200 years ago, there was no concept of hunger or homelessness in this territory. That every creek that is now put underground was fresh water that we could actually drink. And so it's to remind ourselves as, as guests on this land, how do we become good guests? And how do the indigenous people on whose land, how do the Lashan people, how are we able to be good hosts? We need good guests in order to do that. And so taking, working on pieces of land in the Bay Area, we have a quarter acre in East Oakland um, that we have created the first arbor in 250 years. We are regrowing our medicines and traditional foods. We are um, inviting people out to the land to re-engage. We are taking care of land that UC Berkeley owns as part of their project, um, the Gill Track Farms in, Al in Albany. We help to grow food there. We have a small community garden in West Oakland and we're looking for opportunities to work with cities to re-engage in land in other kinds of ways, to have land be given back to the tribes in order to do this important work. And so uh, the Land Trust gives us the vehicle in which to do that, to really engage with people that are our guests um, and to be good hosts and live in reciprocity so that we can all live in a better, uh, better Bay Area where my ancestors have been for thousands of years. So I really um, encourage people to go to SigurteLandTrust.org uh, and to look at our website, find out how you can engage um, in the land process, giving back process and uh, Shumi and other ways that we are doing work. We're on IG and Facebook as well. Thank you, Karina. That's a perfect ending <laughs> for, uh, for our discussion today. Uh, we like to stay on time. So I wanted to thank all of you for joining us and sharing your deeply personal stories with us today. It was really moving. And it looks like from the chat, you're already getting some donations and some new supporters. And Sophie, also um, Con Council Member Han, thank you for uh, calling in as well. And I shared the uh, your website uh, so that people could also contact you directly if they wanted to. So uh, thank you again, everybody. I wanted to just take a second to promote our program for next week that we're uh, going to be sponsoring in an entirely different vein, which is everything you want to know about Palm Springs, but we're afraid to ask. And we're gonna talk with the founders of Palm Springs, Palm Springs Modernism Week. So that's gonna be fun. And they're promoting it as a two martini luncheonar. So to be a little different, it's going to be next Tuesday at noon. That'll be free. And then, John, you have something coming up this Friday. Yeah, we're just going gangbusters with the programs here. <laughs> so I just wanted to talk a little bit about the Friday program, which is on um, digital online mapping tools. I was very impressed uh, with the animation we showed today that Toby shared with us. Um, and I thought it was a really effective way of telling the story. So on Friday, we'll do something a little bit like that. And we'll look at some of the technologies uh, that can be used to record sites like this. Um, and then next Friday, we will also do a more a deeper dive, uh, three hour workshop on how to use those technologies, everything from laser scanning to um, photogrammetry, all these things. So wanted to thank all of our speakers today. I'm going to paste a link into the chat box for all of our attendees. That is an evaluation link. So we would love to hear your thoughts on not only this program, but we would like to hear your thoughts on what other programs we uh, you would like to see us do. We do about 100 programs a year and sometimes we miss things. We really want to hear your thoughts. Maybe we're forgetting uh, uh, groups efforts, advocacy efforts, whatever. Just let us know what you'd like to see uh, promoted on our webinars. And with that, we're going to close out the room. Our speakers are welcome to turn off their videos and microphones. Um, I'm going to leave the room open for people to review the chat. Uh, and um, I'll leave it open for another 10 minutes or so for you to click on that. So have a great day, everyone. Thanks, John. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.